I sent out, or I had uh, somebody sent out an advertisement for this, and uh, the picture that came to mind, whatever I think of religion and politics, um, is this image. It's, uh, it's actually real arms in the Tate Modern Museum. And as you walk in, uh, it's like Madame Tussaud arms, you know what I mean? And they, they stick out of the wall, and they're, they, there's hair on the knuckles, and you know, I mean, it's really realistic. And they, it's very modern 20th century as well. So the suit, uh, you know, the coat and the cuffs, I mean, the guy's got it perfectly. And immediately you think of the hail of Hitler. Uh, you think of the hail of uh, Mussolini's Italy. Okay. And if you've seen uh, Roman um, um, uh, films, you might think of Caesar and the Sig Heil and, and, and this kind of a thing. And uh, because it's 20th century, the garb and everything, you're, you're, you know, you're sort of confronted with that, and it's very strange. And then you read the little tagline, and it says Ave Maria, which is Hail Mary. And uh, then you notice that the arms are about eight feet above you. So as you walk by, they are almost blessing you as you walk underneath. And then you recall the women used to hold their babies up to Hitler and Mussolini to be blessed. But you also recall all the religious imagery uh, that comes through in the uh, hailing and the blessing uh, of popes, of priests. And the image takes on a completely different feel as you're walking underneath it, um, underneath these arms. That ambiguity, I think, is the heart of where religion and politics come together in our culture today. On the one hand, we sometimes feel there's something sinister, it's not quite right. On the other hand, people get a great deal of peace and comfort uh, out of religion, and religion is a tremendously positive force for cultural change and uh, development. And uh, what we try and do in the group for religious and intellectual traditions is bring together and try and work through some of those ambiguities, in this case, with religion and politics. So anyways, I thought that was a very helpful, uh, interesting image, which is why it's there if you saw that. And I'm hoping as well as we hear today that you're going to be unpacking some of these ambiguities in the political right and how powerful it is and how we can study and understand that. So I suppose I'll just turn it over to you and for illumination. Thank you, Tim. It's lovely to be here and exciting to be at the first GRIT seminar for 2012. My name's Marianne Maddox and I'm an ARC Future Fellow studying religion, state and social inclusion for the next four years. And my paper is called How Powerful is Australia's Christian Right? I gave the paper a quantitative sounding title because everybody in the social sciences is very quantitative these days, don't you find? But for those of you from the more anthropological or theological side of religious studies, it has an unofficial title, which is The Powerful Magic of Australia's Christian Right. <laughs> Two influential papers, uh, Smith 2009 and Gleeson 2011, have proposed that the power of Australia's Christian right during the Howard government has been overstated, with the implication that under an Abbott-led government, it could expect little success. In 2009, Rodney Smith published How Would Jesus Vote? The Churches and the Election of the Rudd Government, proposing that any Christian right electoral effect was at least counterbalanced by an equally forceful Christian left. There's something in his argument, but I shall suggest that his analysis missed an important dimension because he overlooked the vital magic element, which at the moment the Christian right wields and the Christian left does not. In 2011, Kate Gleason's Tony Abbott and Abortion, miscalculating the strength of the Christian right, maintained that not only political commentators, such as me, but also conservative politicians themselves, such as Tony Abbott, had been seduced into overestimating the prospects of a moral right swing. The politicians, if not the commentators, she concludes, must have been surprised and disappointed at the failure to wind back Australia's relatively liberal abortion status quo. Well, if they were thinking like legislators, perhaps they were. But 
the history of the Christian right both here and in the USA reminds us that its strategists only sometimes think like legislators whose priority is to change the law now. A lot of the time they think like culture warriors whose long game is to change the culture. Proposing pieces of legislation is a key part of that strategy, but bizarre though it may sound, actually getting them passed into law can be a far lower priority. That's the magic again. I don't have time to go through all Smith and Gleason's arguments, so I'll just address a couple of key ones from each to show how I think that by limiting themselves to strictly quantitative indicators, they miss the Christian right's real and significant influence. Then I will expand on what I mean by magical power and elaborate on some further areas in which I contend it is felt. So first, let's talk about Smith. My very old and very dear friend, Rodney Smith, I was bridesmaid at his wedding and his wife, Liz, was bridesmaid at mine, analysed mainstream news outlets and church media during the 2007 election campaign. And he examined Christian lobby groups that produced voter guides for that election, such as the Australian Christian Lobby on the right and the Centre for an Ethical Society on the left. And he concluded that those different sources of advice to voters balanced one another out. One difficulty with Rod's analysis is that it lacks any measure of audience size or reach. He knows this is what I think, by the way. I've given this analysis in front of him. For the voter guides, for example, his sole source of evidence is that each organisation posted a voter guide on the internet during the 2007 federal election campaign, but we've got no way of knowing how many voters looked at the guides, the uses to which they were put, or the ways in which voters, whether or not they were associated with any particular church or parachurch organisation, um, might have seen or much less taken any notice of guides like that. Um, it's impossible really to tell what sort of use they were put to. To give one anecdotal example, I was surprised in 2010 when I was trying to purchase a low-tech solar oven over the internet in anticipation of my usual oven being out of action during a kitchen renovation, to find that the website of the supplier of environmentally friendly goods with whom I was about to place my order included a tab labelled 2010 Federal Election Issues. The tab led to the Australian Christian Values Institute voter guide and a series of warnings as to why I should not be duped by the Green Party's claim to environmental rectitude, but should instead direct my vote to the Conservative parties. I was just trying to buy a solar oven. <laughs> so, as an admittedly very rough proxy measure of internet penetration, I mean, I don't know if anyone got, you know, there might be quantitatively minded people here who can give me an idea, but um, just tr grasping at a, um, a rough proxy measure for internet penetration, and this was now after the 2010 election, I tried counting search engine recognitions of the name of different groups, plus the phrase 2010 federal election, plus then I put in Australia to screen out um, references to um, international organisations that might have been involved in that year's US federal election, which was going on at a similar time, as you remember. Um, and by that measure, some of the lobbies that Smith analysed achieved much wider attention than others. So I got 191 references for the Catholic Bishops' Conference, 4,750 for the Australian Christian Lobby, um, 80 for the Australian Christian Values Interest, uh, Institute, one for the Centre for an Ethical Society, uh, and 393 for the Festival of Light, and 1,480 for the National Council of Churches. So those figures don't tell us how many people looked at the voter guides, how many websites referred to them. The most they can hope to tell us is how many times the names of the sponsoring groups were associated with the phrase Federal Election 2010 on the day of my search. But, um, and, and obviously the exact phrase admit, omits many variations that might have shown up further relevant associations. But, um, as a very rough guide, 
it does suggest that the Centre for an Ethical Society's impact on public perception of a Christian political voice is likely to have been marginal, while the Australian Christian Lobby's association with the phrase Federal Election 2010 outweighed that of all the other groups put together. So um, the, the, the only take home point, the best you can get to a take home point I think is that the penetration and reach of some of those groups is much more pronounced than of others and the ones that lean politically to the right seem to have a much more, um, have a much more impact than the ones that lean politically to the left. The apparently most compelling part of Smith's analysis deals with an attempt by the Australian Christian Lobby to campaign directly in selected marginal seats, attempting to swing the vote behind their endorsed candidates. And Smith demonstrates that in each targeted seat, the vote either remained steady or swung away from the candidate that the Australian Christian Lobby had endorsed. Well, to long-time followers of Australia's religious right, Actually, that would come as little surprise. No serious commentator that I know of has ever claimed that Australia has a religious right voter base comparable, say, to the numbers of conservative evangelicals who, when mobilised, do have the capacity to swing crucial districts in American elections. Even in the most Bible-based, uh, Bible Belt seats, Australians vote on all kinds of grounds and several forces, which I've discussed in detail elsewhere, mitigate strongly against the kind of religious right mobilisation which few people would deny is a significant factor in at least some US contests. Gleason's miscalculating the strength of the Australian religious right is a slightly different argument. She argues that it's not just political commentators but conservative politicians themselves who overestimated the strength of the Australian religious right and who <coughs> therefore pinned too strong an expectation on the power of a so-called religious vote to be able to um, uh, su successfully back a uh, rolling back of Australia's relatively liberal status quo, particularly on abortion. And Kate Gleeson wrote that while she was an Australian, uh, an ARC postdoctoral fellow, um, working on debates about abortion in Australian parliaments. And so she was particularly concerned just with that one issue. So the first thing to say is that judging the strength of the Australian religious right by the single issue of abortion it's quite a tricky thing because abortion is almost entirely a matter of state law and the only time that it has really become a matter of federal debate since the 1970s was on the question of ministerial veto over the abortifacent drug IU486 which was under the control of the federal health minister who at the time was Tony Abbott and that one debate was really not at all about the legality of abortion. It was only about whether the health minister should have a right of veto over that one particular drug. So it's quite difficult to make an, a, a, an argument about the power of the religious right federally out of a, an issue that is almost entirely dealt with at state level. Um, having said that, Gleason's argument is it's a little bit difficult to see quite what she is intending to say because she concludes by um, pointing out that actually um, the, uh, Tony Abbott's time as Federal Health Minister did produce some results for a conservative position on abortion, uh, namely the introduction of the so-called pregnancy helpline, which provided counselling for pregnant women, which was um, mainly supplied by uh, anti-abortion counselling services, so that <coughs> um, access to counselling that might encourage women to seek abortion services was harder to obtain. So her argument seems to be that uh, Abbott didn't 
succeed in getting abortion outlawed. However, it's difficult to see how he could have expected to do so as Federal Health Minister, um, given that abortion isn't covered by uh, federal law. So, uh, and the other thing is that, the other thing that makes Gleason's argument a little problematic is that for her case about how commentators have miscalculated the power of the religious right, she, although she refers to commentators in general and to particular commentators at different points, she <coughs> uh, draws particularly heavily on Amanda Laurie's quarterly essay where Amanda Laurie talks about the churches repeatedly, that the churches make sound and fury about abortion and homosexuality and so on. Um, but both Laurie and Gleason used the churches in a very blanket way when almost all the time what they really mean is official statements of the Catholic Church and pay no attention to variation within the positions of different, um, uh, different uh, denominations. So, um, the, however, despite the fact that, as she points out, Abbott didn't succeed in uh, changing what is Australia's relatively liberal abortion status quo, I contend that the, um, the cultural framework within which debates about sexuality and bioethical issues did change over the period of um, the Howard government, not only, uh, or not even particularly about abortion, but due to other um, pieces of mooted legislation. And this is where we get back to the point that for culture warriors, both in Australia and in the US, if we take a longer historical view of the religious right rather than just looking at one particular period of government, we see that proposing legislation is an important strategy, but getting it through passed into law isn't always the point. Um, I, and my um, touchstone example for the Howard government is actually not uh, um, cha changes to abortion law, which after all the federal parliament doesn't um, have much to say about, but the uh, changes to the Sex Discrimination Act um, to do with reproductive technology. So you'll remember that, or you might remember, um, the, there was a case in Victoria concerning a single woman who wanted to have access to um, in vitro fertilisation technology and uh, that was problematic because the Sex Discrimination Act, which is federal law, prevents uh, discrimination on the basis of somebody's marital status among other um, criteria. And the, so the federal liberals introduced the Sex Discrimination Amendment Bill, which would have changed the Sex Discrimination Act to allow the states to discriminate on the basis of sexuality and marital status so that states, if they so wished, could limit the use of artificial reproductive technologies to, or to, could restrict it so that only heterosexual married couples could have access to artificial reproductive technologies. And both Howard and Tony Abbott made the argument repeatedly that the reason for that was so that all children could have the right to the care and affection of both a mother and father. And it was repeatedly pointed out that, of course, restricting access to reproductive technologies would do no such thing. All it would mean would be that at the moment of conception, a child would have um, a, both a mother and a father, and not even that necessarily, because um, uh, you could you can imagine all sorts of circumstances in which people can be married and still get around um, that requirement. Uh, but that became that. Now that piece of legislation was never passed. In fact, it wasn't even um, through. It, it lapsed with successive parliaments. So it stayed on the books. Had to be re uh, 
as a parliament lapsed, it had to be reintroduced into the next parliament, lapsed again, it had to be reintroduced into the next parliament. So it didn't even make it to second reading speech status um, in its final, the final time that it was introduced. That was a piece of legislation that its purpose was arguably not to get passed into law at all, but just to generate a lot of discussion about what is a family, what does it mean to have a mother and a father, why are some kinds of families better than others. Um, if it had got passed into legislation, that might well have been a, um, a bonus, but uh, in terms of uh, generating change in the culture, in, in the terms of what is often called culture war, although I don't actually like that term very much because in the real wars people actually get killed and maimed and so on, but uh, nevertheless in terms of the struggle to realign the culture, generating the discussion and having the editorials and the front pages and the headlines can be achieved without necessarily having to actually pass the legislation. A prime US parallel of that was the so-called Constitution Restoration Bill, which was a um, Republican proposition to change the Constitution so that um, uh, laws could not be deemed invalid on the grounds, or, or it's, it's, it's one of those ones that's captured in so many double negatives that it's hard to make it make sense, but the end result would have been that um, the Supreme Court couldn't say that a law was invalid if its basis was that God is the, is the source of all law. Um, now, it's very hard to imagine that that could ever have been, uh, could, could ever have survived um, any sort of challenge. But again, the po that's, that's an example of one where it doesn't really matter whether it survives a challenge or not, that's not the point. The point is the amount of um, discussion and steam and heat that it generates in the talkback shows and in the, um, yeah, in, in, the um, in the culture. That's, that's why culture war is culture war, that's what it's about. So um, Kate Gleason comes close to acknowledging that herself in reference to the abortion debate in Australia where she says that what pinning his um, uh, name to abortion debate did for Tony Abbott was to badge his conservative credentials and to stir up uh, contention within the Labor Party. It was obviously a, a successful wedge issue within the Labor Party because it divided the um, Catholic and non-Catholic Labor members from one another. But she then goes on to say it was not a success, it backfired, it was potentially even counterproductive because it led to a, that cross-party align, alignment of female MPs who joined forces over um, the RU486 legislation. I think that by saying that she misses the point, however, that uh, that's, that's the magic element of Christian right politics where it doesn't matter how many people you offend and put offside in a way because those people are, were always going to stand opposed to that position anyway. The point is how many people you get having the argument and having the debate and making things sayable that previously perhaps were not sayable within the cultural environment. So if the power of Australia's religious right is not in swinging numbers of voters, then wherein does it lie? Well, that's the magic. You see, there are, as Smith says, two competing Christian voices in the public square a left and a right. I think they probably address about similarly sized constituencies. But one of the competing voices has been heard much more loudly than the other in public discourse. And it has achieved greater policy success. So getting away from the sex and bodies based examples that are usually um, conjured in re relation to religious right issues, the ones that, that I'll address are government funding of religious schools, government funding of evangelical Christian chaplains in state schools, and the so far successful opposition to same-sex marriage. Those policy directions have been successful not because there's a raging fundamentalist voter base out there waiting to take revenge on a government that doesn't do its bidding. There isn't. On the contrary, the push for all those three initiatives has come mainly from the side of politicians. 
not from a, um, a, a, a grassroots push. To spell out my thesis in more detail, among Australia's dwindling number of believers, broadly speaking, the mainline churches have often been advocates for political causes of the left, while Pentecostal, Evangelical and parachurch groups have tended to espouse causes more aligned to the political right. Both represent small and numerically roughly similar church constituencies. Neither commands such a compelling majority that it could be said to represent a Christian vote in anything resembling, for example, the sense that US Republican Party was able to call on the evangelical right during the George Bush administrations. Both address their constituencies with voting advice, which, however carefully framed as bipartisan, translate into clear and distinct party preferences. And Rod Smith point, pointed that out with a very careful analysis. Broadly, some direct their audience towards parties that put their primary emphasis on conservative stances on issues of sexual and bioethical morality. I mean, the, the lobby groups put their emphasis there and direct party preferences towards parties that will back that up, such as abortion, euthanasia, same-sex marriage and adoption, assisted reproductive technologies and so on, while other lobby groups favour parties that emphasise human rights, social justice, environmental concerns, advocacy for refugees and asylum seekers, indigenous people, workers, the unemployed, greater equality for same-sex couples, environmental protection and so on. And Smith is right to point out that the push for a religious voice in the public square comes from both sides of the political divide, but not every voice in the public square receives equal attention. As Uniting Justice National spokesperson Reverend Eleni Poulos lamented at the Now We the People conference in 2005, she said, during the last federal election campaign, George Pell and Peter Jensen had significant media coverage when they decided to criticise Labor's school funding policy. But who heard about the Uniting Church calling for a commitment from both parties to cancel the debt of the world's poorest countries or commit to a treaty process with Indigenous Australians? Not only has have one of the competing voices been heard much more loudly than the other in public discourse, but it has also achieved greater success in the actual outcomes. We can see this more clearly by looking at a case study of the Australian Christian Lobby, which is one of the groups that has been particularly successful in gaining media traction. The Australian Christian Lobby was initially called the Australian Christian Coalition, modelled on the American Christian Coalition, and began as an activity of a Queensland megachurch, the Mansfield Christian Outreach Centre. According to an open letter to delegates at the 1995 Christian Outreach Centre Annual General Conference, um, a lay leader and Australian Christian Coalition founder, John Galliardi, the lobby's purpose was to, quote, counter the, the influence of homosexual euthanasia and abortion lobby groups. The Australian Christian lobby, as it became, represents itself as non-aligned and rigorously bipartisan, campaigning on only on issues about which it says a majority of Christians agree. However, since surveys of Christians in churches have consistently shown over a long period that a majority of them support a right to abortion and euthanasia in at least some circumstances, while a 2011 Galaxy poll found a majority of self-identified Christians supporting same-sex marriage, I've always preferred to refer to it as the Australian so-called Christian lobby. <laughs> and um, the library has put up the Mardi Gras display to <laughs> illustrate just that point. <laughs> From the outset, the Australian Christian Coalition, as it was then called, was based in the national capital, Canberra, and indeed owed its conception to a conversation there at the 1995 National Prayer Breakfast between founder John Galliardi and retired Baptist minister John McNichol. Its original leadership drew heavily on the senior ranks of the Christian Outreach Centre megachurch. In 2001, it was renamed as the Australian Christian Lobby and appointed retired Brigadier Jim Wallace as its executive chairman. And still today, the Australian Christian Lobby retains its connections with the Mansfield Christian Outreach Centre and the Brisbane megachurch world from which it sprang. 
one of its five board members in 2010, Graham Packer, as chairman of the Mansfield Christian Outreach Centre and on the council of its Christian Heritage College. Rick Benson, senior pastor of Kenmore Baptist Church, is another connection on the board to the ACL's Christian megachurch, uh, Brisbane megachurch background. Sorry. Why does that matter? Well, scholarly consensus suggests that congregation size, whether you're a megachurch or not, has superseded denomination, whether you're Baptist or Catholic or United or what, as a determinant of political and cultural character. So megachurches, which are broadly defined as Protestant churches with congregations of 2,000 or more members, and particularly outside the USA, display consistent and predictable characteristics, including a hierarchical structure, authoritarian and male-dominated leadership, preference for free market solutions to social problems, and a strong likelihood of conservative political orientation. The Australian Christian Lobby is one of several conservative political movements, others include Salt Shakers and the political party Family First, that have developed out of megachurches, and those characteristics have carried over into their public policy proposals. So although all of those make a thing of being non-denominational and saying therefore they must be non-partisan and non-aligned, in fact they align with a quite strong political orientation that is associated with the megachurch movement out of which they spring. Moving on to the examples of um, education uh, funding of church schools, uh, chaplains and same-sex marriage that I think are uh, good indicators of the power of Australia's Christian right, the magical power for getting things done. Let's turn first to the story about funding of um, religious schools. How are we going for time, Tim? Yeah. I'm sitting here with right guilt because I forgot to introduce... This is the foremost Australian religion and politics. This is Mary and I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please keep talking. Okay. Smith, in 2009, on page 619, not that you need to know that, said, um, by early 2007, this is about the church school funding issue, um, the Labor Party had reversed its policy. So this is the Labor Party having a um, heart attack over the um, attacks that it sustained over the Mike Latham private school hit list. You know how in 2004 they made noises suggesting that they might be going to take some money away from private schools and um, the Howard government said, oh, they've got a um, private school hit list and they're going to start um, attacking private schools. And so ever since then, the Labor Party is sort of... Uh, thrown a, a panic at anything, any mention of anything to do with private schools. And so in, Smith says, in, by early 2007, the Labor Party had reversed its policy, stating that, quote, no school will be worse off, no school will have its funding cut. Labor promised to, quote, consult widely with the Catholic and independent education systems on our approach to schools funding generally and on detailed funding issues. This policy shift cannot be interpreted, now this is Rod Smith speaking, this policy shift cannot be interpreted as a specific concession to the Christian right, since criticism of Labor's 2004 policy had come from across the spectrum of mainstream denominations. The 2007 policy was an attempt to neutralise that broadly based opposition. Well, to interpret it like that requires a very curious interpretation of what counts as a Christian right position. I find it hard to think of a more fundamental left-wing position than universal free compulsory secular education. Um, numerous observers from education commentators to a Senate inquiry have argued that changes to the federal funding of religious schools that were introduced progressively by the Howard government from 1996 and continued by its Labor successes from 2007 are actively dismantling that long-standing access that Australian children have enjoyed to universal, free, compulsory, secular education. Smith's argument at this point, I think, more accurately shows that when it comes to the issues of school funding, even many churches not normally associated with a Christian right position moved to the right and adopted a right-wing stance. The other thing to say is that when Smith says that the spectrum of mainstream denominations were active on the issue in 2004 of 
federal government funding to religious schools, actually the spectrum of mainstream denominations was actually mainly Anglicans and Catholics, or actually some Anglicans and Catholics. With the Uniting Church, Australia's third largest denomination noticeably silent on the issue. In fact, a position paper prepared by Uniting Care New South Wales ACT, which is the social welfare arm of the Uniting Church of New South Wales and Australian Capital Territory Synod, pointed out in 2005 that for years Uniting Church schools, which could all be classified as wealthy and were represented by the Peak Body Independent Schools Council of Australia, had been lobbying for a greater share of public funds, while the church's social justice and other institutional arms had been expressing grave reservations about and sometimes even calling for cuts to government funding for wealthy schools, including its own. So the um, voice of the churches, um, as Amanda Laurie liked to call them, is not actually that unified on the, the schools issue. In 2010, the United Churches Victorian and Tasmanian Synod's Uniting Youth Ministries website devoted a page headed Why Public Education Matters to encouraging petition signatures and full submissions to the federal government's inquiry into schools funding in support of the Australian Education Union's campaign for greater support for public schools. So I don't think that you can say that just because some churches that traditionally support left-wing causes supported more funding for religious schools, that makes it a not a right-wing issue, and I don't think that you can say that all the churches did support it because they didn't. Um, in Australia now, nearly 40% of all students attend private schools. More than 40% of secondary students attend private schools. In the ACT, more than 50% of students between Year 7 and Year 10 attend private schools. Private schools uh, almost universally church schools, uh, religious schools, and within that almost universally uh, Christian schools. There are very small numbers of Muslim, Jewish, and a few other kinds of schools. Uh, and there are quite a small number of ones in the Montessori, um, Waldorf, uh, specialist arts, performing arts, other kinds of schools that aren't religious, but overwhelmingly the federal funding that goes to religious schools, goes go to private schools, goes to religious schools, equals Christian schools. Um, of those, some are the elite Christian schools that we're used to thinking about, the King's Scots, MLC, PLC kind of ones. Uh, some are very small schools which teach their students, for example, this is a direct quote, that from one, that our aim is not to turn our, train our students to be good citizens of Australia, but to be soldiers of the Lord, ready to take on uh, the enemies of our Lord and his dominions. Um, uh, some of those schools, the small independent Christian schools, receive a greater percentage of their funding from government sources than do some so-called public schools. Um, I'll say that again, they receive a greater percentage of their funding than some so-called public schools, raising the question of what actually is a private school or a public school. It's not secret information, you can find it all out from my school website. Um, so, uh, in the current environment, the uh, doling out of public funds to religious bodies for purposes only some of which are secular and public, and only some of which for schools are actually directed towards education. The, uh, I, I have a um, document from the Catholic Education Office saying that education is not its first priority, its first priority is um, training students to be good Catholics. So um, uh, in, in this environment, I think we do have to say that uh, uh, the religious right uh, has achieved considerable successes. Amanda Laurie's criterion is that at the end of the day, what matters is who gets what piece of the public purse. And Kate Gleason says, in terms of abortion, not very much. Well, in terms of education, a lot. Um, chaplains, my next example. Uh, the National School Chaplaincy Program was introduced by John Howard at a cost of $165 million to 
um, have, uh, again, overwhelmingly Christian chaplains operating in public and private schools. It was extended by Kevin Rudd in 2007 at a cost of 45 million and extended and expanded by Julia Gillard at a cost of 222 million, which you'll note is more than the Howard and Rudd expenditure put together. Um, so working backwards, you can see that the biggest amount of money spent on Christian chaplains in um, Australian schools was spent by an atheist prime minister. The second biggest amount was spent by a not terribly religious prime minister. Um, if you want my take on why Howard's not a terribly religious prime minister, it's we haven't got time to go into that now, but I've published on it extensively. And the most devout Prime Minister that we've had spent a, uh, the meagerest $45 million. Um, when uh, she took over the Labour leadership, uh, Julia Gillard was questioned by Jim Wallace of the Australian Christian Lobby about whether she would be maintaining the National School Chaplaincy Program, but even he could not probably have imagined the lavishness with which she would be maintaining it. And uh, not only that, but that the thousand new places that she um, uh, spent, that, that she put money aside for, were um, particularly to expand it further into the state school system, the public school system. And Jim Wallace of the Australian Christian Lobby asked her, will it be, uh, can you give us a guarantee that it will be chaplaincy based in the faith, the Christian faith. And Gillard replied, it will be a chaplaincy program with all that that implies. The program did entail an option for secular pastoral care workers, but Gillard made very clear in her interview that they were to be an option of last resort. And she gave Queensland as an example, saying that of course in Queensland that won't be needed because in Queensland we already have, the schools have such very good relationships with the churches. She didn't really mean the churches, because in Queensland the school chaplains were not supplied by any churches, they were supplied by Scripture Union Queensland, which um, I'm sure everybody here knows is an evangelical Christian organisation with a particular mission to convert children to its own particular strand of evangelical Christianity. Um, so our atheist Prime Minister is the uh, most lavish supporter of placing evangelical Christian chaplains in state schools. I realise I'm glossing over here. I can back up everything that I'm saying, but I'm, I'm just saying it quickly, so do um, you know, poke me in questions. Uh, but uh, once again, given that, uh, as Rodney Smith has demonstrated, Jim Wallace can't command votes even in seats that he particularly targets, why would she do that? Well, once again I say that's the magic and I'm going to tell you about the magic in a minute. Um, I don't think I've got time to tell you about the same-sex marriage example, have I? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> the same-sex marriage story is, um, I mean you can tell what I'm going to say, the, the atheist Prime Minister who doesn't support a same-sex marriage even though she's got a uh, dedicated church-going lesbian finance minister who supported the um, uh, motion to change ALP policy, uh, even though uh, over 50% of self-identified Christians say that they support same-sex marriage, but Julia Gillard, because she went to Mitcham Baptist Church, she believes that there are some things that uh, we have to keep the same. Um, she, uh, we don't need to go there, probably. Uh, so, so what is magic? Well, you might not believe in it. You might be able to dis disprove it by a thousand empirical tests. But magic is still real in important ways. It still wields important real-world effects. Ask the person who's become sick after being hexed. Ask the person who's been killed on suspicion of witchcraft. Well, of course, you can't ask them. They're dead. And that's the point. Few effects could be more real. Australia's Christian right commands negligible votes. Its actual campaigns end as often as not in defeat. Its impressive roll call of organisations and ginger groups turn out on closer inspection to be the same. Relatively few very enthusiastic people turning out under a bewildering, bewildering array of titles. 
Yet it seemingly has persuaded an atheist Prime Minister who herself lives in an irregular relationship to oppose same-sex marriage on the grounds of tradition, who argued in Parliament that she wants a national curriculum that will equip students to make their own informed choices about what to believe, and which yet alone among the world's most developed nations offers them no K-12 general religious education, and instead presents with varying degrees of coercion from state to state, faith-based single tradition indoctrination in school hours and evangelical chaplains to, um, according to the Victorian provider of such chaplains, go and make disciples. Magic wields its effects beyond the visible realm and also beyond the rationally explicable, but of course it is rationally explicable. In April, I will be appearing, oddly enough, at the uh, speaking at the Global Atheist Convention. I did explain to them that I wasn't sure I fitted the selection criteria, um, but there will be a panel on um, religion and politics, and uh, one of the other panel members will be Fiona Patton from the Australian Sex Party. She says that whenever she speaks to politicians, they say, look, I'd love to support what you're campaigning for, but I can't because of the Australian Christian Lobby. I said, tell them to come to talk to me. The Australian Christian Lobby doesn't amount to anything. Uh, they don't command any votes. They, don't, um, uh, they, they can't sway any seats. She said, but everyone can't, is too terrified to move because of the Australian Christian Lobby. That's the effect of the magical force, the powerful magic of Australia's Christian right. It works because you believe it works. It works as long as it conveys an impression of power, an impression of influence. So along with the Australian Christian Lobby, the National Marriage Forum, the National Fathers uh, Foundation, Fatherhood Foundation, the National Prayer Breakfast, the uh, 714 Group, the um, uh, National uh, Christian Leaders Association, the National uh, Heart Ministries, I could go on and on, and um, in various published works I have gone on and on. There is an um, endless list of different organisations that all claim to represent an Australian Christian right voice, but in fact, when you look behind them, they amount to Jim Wallace, um, Warwick Marsh, and the same few very enthusiastic people, salt shakers, um, and almost no on the ground grassroots support. But yet they managed to wield an influence in public policy, in schools, in our education system, in our Marriage Act, in um, healthcare, that is way beyond any numerical force. And survey after survey shows that. Magical indeed. <laughs>